Hello everybody, and welcome to the Orkney Storytelling Festival 2020 online. Now, I'm Tom Muir, and I'm part of the team that brings the festival to the public. We're the people that create the magic. Some of us you don't see, some of us you do. But this year we've had to change. We had everything planned. After their last festival, we had two great storytellers booked, Anne Hunter and Mio Shudo. And then COVID came and everything changed. But our committee decided that we should go on with the festival in some shape or form because we felt that people need stories now more than ever. Unfortunately, the Orkney Isles Council's Culture Fund were very supportive in us moving from live to online. And although COVID has kept us away from people, it has actually brought people together in other ways. So we will be working this year with the Wild Goose Festival from Dumfries. So one of, if not the most southerly storytelling festivals in Scotland and the most northerly one are working together in collaboration and sharing stories, which is what it's all about, really. Now, as we can't get together and we can't uh, have live performances as we normally would do, then we have decided to make these films. And in tribute to Blue Peter, I would say, here's one we made earlier. I hope you enjoy it. This is a story from Ireland from my grandmother's grandmother's time. Ned Clancy lived in a wee cabin with his mother on the knees of the mountain. And he was famous up and down the county. Or perhaps I should say infamous, because Ned was a fiddle player. He loved to play the fiddle. And there was hardly ever a wedding or a wake or a party that Ned would be there on a stool by the fire playing his fiddle. The old Irish washerwoman. Now the trouble is, the old Irish washerwoman, it's a lovely tune, it sets the toes tapping, but it was the only tune that Ned could play. Oh, he had tried to learn other tunes many times, and people were joking that the fiddle must be cursed, because every time Ned tried to learn another tune, it would sound like an old tomcat in a bucket, down a well. Things had gotten so bad, that people were starting to pretend that parties were over when they weren't really. Somebody would douse the lamps and smooth the fire and walk Ned to the door and bid him good night. And many a night he found himself on his way home down a stony road and he'd hear a party starting up again that he'd left just five minutes earlier. It was on one just such a night as that, as he stumbled down a stony track with the stars above him, Ned was wishing for the hundredth time that he could learn another tune. What he didn't notice was he was standing on a wee humpback bridge. Now anyone will tell you, you should be careful about making wishes on a humpback bridge because a bridge is neither here nor there. And sure enough, he hadn't gone another 10 yards when he heard hoofbeats on the road behind him. Too small for a horse, too fast for a donkey, too big for a goat. Alongside him, suddenly out in the starlight, came a beautiful bay pony. Hello, said Ned. Aren't you the handsome fellow? I've still a mile to go home and walking would be quicker than riding. But as soon as he put his hand to the pony's mane and went to mount up, bum, up in the air he was tossed, head over heels, over head over heels, and bang, he landed on the rough, hairy back of a puka and he heard its deep, gravelly laugh. Oh no, cried Ned, let me go, and he cradled his fiddle against him. Hold on tight, Ned Clancy, said the puka. Hold on tight, or I'll buck you into the bog. 
up on its great hind legs it's reared, and two great curved horns sprouted from its head. Let me go, let me go, cried Ned, and my mother will be waiting for me. Your mother have a wait yet, said the pooka, and off it went, galloping down the lane. Let me go, cried Ned. Hold on, said the pooka, or I'll toss you into the bog. Well, if you get tossed into the bog, you seldom come out. So poor Ned held on for dear life to the horns with one hand and his fiddle with the other. Down the lane they went, through the thorny hedge they went, over the rough field they went, and then to Ned's horror, he realised they were heading for the edge of the cliff. Stop! Stop! he cried, and the pooka did. Stopped dead. And Ned went flying up into the air, head over heels, over head, over heels, and over the cliff. Down he went, clutching the fiddle, expecting at any moment to be dashed to pieces on the jagged rocks, and bam! It wasn't the rocks he'd landed on. It was linen. A great pile Fine linen, shirts and shifts and, and, and wonderful, beautiful fine linen clothing. And as Ned looked about him, all along the shoreline, there were women, fairy women, washing the linen on the rocks, wringing it and scrubbing it and beating it on the rocks, the water dripping from their hair like seaweed and their bright grey eyes all turned to look at Ned. A fiddler? cried one. A fiddler, they all whispered along the beach. We are washing our fairy king Finvara's linen, said the woman nearest to Ned. It's hard work and a long night, and the time would go much quicker if we had some music, Ned Clancy. Well, what could Ned do? He picked up the fiddle and the bow, but he only knew one tune, and he was afraid that the washerwomen fairy women might think he was mocking them. But there was nothing else for it. He put the bow to the strings. Tunes, wonderful tunes. Slips and jigs and reels and slides, airs. It was absolutely magical. Hundreds of tunes came flooding out of Ned's fiddle. His fingers were smoking. He had never played like it in his life before. The fairy women went on ringing and beating and washing, and soon all the linen was done. Thank you, Ned Clancy, said the fairy woman nearest him. And she handed him a bundle of a beautiful linen shirt, all tied up, and inside it was filled with gold coins. Here is a reward, she said. And as soon as Ned touched it, he found himself back on the stony road home. The sun was up and the day had broken. Well, Ned hurried home as fast as he could, clutching the linen shirt full of gold and his fiddle over his shoulder. But as he rushed up the field towards his mother's house, he could hear howling and crying and lamenting and there was a great crowd of people all around. He could hear his mother out at the gate. Oh, my Ned, oh, my son, where is he gone? I'll never see him again. And as Ned came in the door, her grief soon turned to astonishment and even sooner to anger. Where have you been? she said. Three days and three nights you're gone and not a word out of you. And the turf not cut and, and the cow not milked and the pig not fed. Three days, said Ned, looking at all the people crowding around the house. Three days and three nights. I was away with the fairies, he said. And an old fellow by the fire muttered, where well, we've known that for years. I, 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 they've stolen time from me, said Ned. And the old fellow by the fire said, yeah, fairies will do that. Well, said Ned, I have learned a hundred new tunes. And he said proudly, showing off to everyone in the room, I have made our fortune, mother. I have enough tunes to keep you dancing to the end of your days. And here, I have enough gold to keep us in comfort to the end of our days. And he put the bundle down on the table. But the fine linen shirt was now an old greasy rag of sacking. And where there had been a pile of gold coins, there was nothing more than smelly, stinky old shells from the seashore. They've, they've cheated me, said Ned. And the old fellow by the fire said, hey, yeah, fairies will do that to you too. People started nudging each other and muttering and giggling. <laughs> Play us one of your new tunes then, Ned, they cried. And everyone braced themselves to hear the old Irish washerwoman again. Well, I don't need to tell you. Ned was feeling very downhearted. But what else could he do? He tucked the fiddle under his chin. But the, his fingers were tingling with magic as he put the bowl to the strings. Yeah.
dancing, some people came running from the other cabins bringing bottles of beer and jugs of parching, someone brought a ham, someone brought a filch of ellen and a salmon and everyone was having a grand party in no time and there was a pile of coins stacking up on the mantelpiece. Well from that day to this, Ned was famous up and down the county streets for the play and there was never a wedding or a wake or a party but Ned would be there on the chair near the fire playing away on his fiddle a hundred tunes except for one. He never again played the old Irish washing
Now, since it is the year of coasts and waters in 2020, this seems like a good excuse to tell you one of my favourite Dundee sea stories. And it is absolutely a true story. Apparently. Now, those of you who are lucky enough to have visited Dundee will probably have noticed that we now have not one but two bridges going between Dundee and the shores of Fife to the south, crossing the Tay. But in the days before these bridges were built, of course, if you wanted to go south to Dundee, you had to get a boat. And there was a regular ferry that ran between Newport and Fife and Dundee. And in 1815, the man who was in charge of this ferry was a man whose name was Cossack Jock, that was what he was known as. And he was a great boatman. But there was one Sunday in late May in 1815, and it seemed like the weather was about to improve for the summer. But there came one last terrible storm on the Tay. And Cossack Jock did his best to save his boat, but she went down along with all of the 22 passengers. And the last anyone saw of Jock was him flailing around among the wreckage, trying desperately to save any passengers that he could. But nobody could have got out of that storm alive. And poor Jock's body was the last of all of them to be found. He washed up at a place called the Craig Pier, which is just by Dundee Harbour, not far from his own little house. So when he washed up, they, they took his body in and they laid it out in his own house awaiting a funeral because that was the custom at the time. And it let everybody come by to say goodbye to Jock because he was popular with the fishing and the boating community in Dundee, so there were sailors and fishwives and fishermen and harbour men all coming in to pay their last respects to Jock. And he was a tall man. He made a very imposing corpse lying there on the bed. And the house was buzzing with people, recounting all the memories of the songs he used to sing and the stories he used to tell. But all of a sudden, while everyone was chatting away, one of the mourners standing by Jock's bedside, they gave a gasp. And people stopped what they were doing and there was silence and they looked over towards Jock on the bed. And in the flickering candlelight, there was no mistaking it, his arm was moving. There was something happening beneath the sheets, they could see that his hand seemed to be shifting from his side. And everybody screamed and people rushed towards the door and everyone was blocking the exit. They were, they were terrified they had to get out there. And a few who had not made it to the door in time just pressed themselves against the wall and they watched as the movement carried on up the side of Jock's body and it looked like his hand was slowly creeping up towards his head at the top of the sheet and they could see the fingers moving and anyone that could still bear to watch held their breath and, and there was a loud clattering sound and the people looked to the bed and trailing its way out of the sheets and across the floor, there was a huge black crab. It had not been Jock's hand that was moving, it was this creature. But were people relieved? No. It's the devil! They shrieked. And people were happy now to run to the other side of the room and huddle around the corpse just to get away from this satanic crab that was scurrying across the floor and they were screaming Satan and evil as the crab made its way for the door and of course people outside heard the commotion and they gathered round the house standing at a good distance just 
just in case, to see what was going to come out of the cottage. And this crab, he goes over the threshold and he knows that the sea is nearby, his crab senses are telling him that, so obviously this crab just wants a quiet life and is scuttling off towards the harbour as fast as he can go and people are diving out of the way of this cursed crab. Until the crab had the misfortune to walk into the path of old Creel Katie. Now Katie was an old wife who wandered the shores and she would gather this and that and beachcomb for a living. And she saw this crab and she made a swipe for his back legs and picked him up and dangled it in front of an absolutely horrified crowd of people. And she asks, what are you lot letting such a bra big part and go away for? And everyone cried, leave him, Katie. It's no canny. That's not a crab. That's the devil himself. But Katie looked at it and she thought, devil or crab? That looks like a good meal. And she put the crab into her creel and she promised him a good long summer in the pot this evening for herself and her husband Davy, who had not been keeping too well. And she went home to her wee cottage and that is exactly what she did. And her neighbours claimed that they'd seen a huge gust of black smoke reeking of pitch and brimstone come bursting out of her chimney as she cooked him. And others said that they'd actually seen old Clutie himself come leaping out from Katie's chimney with its horns and its hooves and his tail. But all Katie would say about the matter was that that was as sweet a bit of a crab as she had ever eaten. And what's more... It had helped her good man out of his illness. And that is not something that she thought the devil was likely to do for such a kind and Christian body as her husband, Davy. So that was the end of the crab, and it was certainly the end of Cossack Jock as well. And it's also the end of the story. Let me tell you something that happened to a friend of mine. For anonymity's sake, let's call him Henry. Now, Henry is a critical, sceptical kind of person. He does not normally care for ghost stories. In fact, this is the only one he ever told me. And he never wanted to speak of it again. Now, Henry had rented a holiday cottage in the countryside with a couple of friends. The cottage was from the 1700s and Henry says it was lovely, very cosy. There was nothing that kept him up in the night, no creaking floorboards or any, anything like that. He did, however, have a very strange dream already on the first or second night that they were there. In this dream, he was in the living room of the cottage, and it looked just like it did in real life. The walls were there, complete with pictures. The fireplace was there. But the floor was just grass and earth, as if nothing had ever been built on that spot. And in the ground, there was a small, stone-lined kist. It was too far away to see properly, but it was there. And that was it. Nothing else happened. There was no plot to the dream. It was just Henry seeing this kiss. But when he woke up, he felt terrified. So terrified did he feel that he could not even have breakfast in the living room the next morning. He could easily override this feeling of unease the next day by just spending some lovely time with his friends. But the night after that, he had a very similar dream. This time, he was slightly closer to this kiss in the ground. 
far enough away still, but close enough to be able to see that there was something in it. And he couldn't quite explain it, but he got this sense of death, just looking at it. And then he woke up, feeling terrified, just like the previous morning. He spent another lovely day with his friends, although having the same or a similar dream twice, it does stay on your mind a little bit more during the day, he said. So that night, when he went to bed, he felt that the atmosphere of the dream he had the previous night was still lingering, as if it were waiting for him. And he did have a third dream about that kiss. Like in the previous two dreams, he was in the living room, the walls were there, complete with pictures, the fireplace was there, but the floor was grass and earth, as if nothing had ever been built on that spot. And this time, he was standing very close to the kist. It was lined with stones, but before he could make out what was inside it, two bare feet appeared at the edge of the kist. Before he could look up who these feet belonged to, he woke up. And he swears that while he woke up, he could sense a voice in his head shouting at him, urging him to run away, to go home that same day. He had not told his friends about these dreams. He thought they would perhaps laugh at him. Funnily enough, however, one of his friends gets his phone out and shows Henry an article about the history of the cottage that they were staying in. As they already knew, it was built sometime in the 1700s. But apparently, before it was built, there had been a local protest. The locals did not agree with this cottage being built. And why? There was a burial mound on that site containing several burials, prehistoric burials. And they did not like the idea of that being leveled. Because though we all know, if you disturb a mound, all sorts of misfortune can happen afterwards. The landlord, however, he did not much care for those kind of tales. And he had this mound leveled nonetheless and had his cottage built. But, according to this article, there was one kist, one grave, that was buried deeper than all the other ones. And that was left in place. A note was made of it, a sketch was made of it, but it was never excavated. The cottage was built over it. The article furthermore says that the owner of the cottage died not long after the cottage had been built. In his chair near the fireplace in the living room. Henry says that he cut his holiday short having to go home. He made up some excuse to leave early. I don't know if I believe his story, but the cottage still stands. So if there is any truth to the story, this grave is still there to this day. Not so long ago, in a village near you, 
they lived a fool. And he did so many foolish things that he always ran into trouble. And the people were laughing at him and telling him, you should get yourself some brains. The fool went to his mother and said, Mother, I'm going to buy myself a mug of brains. Oh, that is wonderful, said his mother. I'm so delighted because, you know, I'm getting on a bit and I will not always be there to look after you. And you sure need your own brains to look after yourself. Just go up the hill to the wise woman. You know, the one with the cauldron and the potions, the herbs and the spells. She will be able to help you. So the fool went up the hill and there was the wise woman. She was stirring something in her cauldron. And the, bra the fool looked in and said, Are you boiling some brains in there? No said the wise woman. But I've come to buy some brains. Do you have some for sale? Depends what you want, said the wise woman. I'm out of professor's brains, king's brains and politician's brains. They're no longer for sale. Oh, no, no, said the fool. Just an ordinary brain, just like almost everybody has or thinks they have. That'll do me fine. The wise woman said, I think I can help you, but first you have to help yourself. Bring me the heart of the thing you love most in the world. And then we'll see. I will ask you a small riddle and we'll find out if we can get you some brains. Oh, the heart of the thing I love most in the world. What would that be? I can't help you anymore with that, said the wise woman and took her cauldron to the back of the house. The fool walked back down the hill and while he was walking, his stomach started rumbling. And he thought to himself, I know what I like most in the world, bacon. And he went home and butchered their only pig. He cut out the heart, wrapped it in some paper and took it up the hill to the wise woman. The wise woman was sitting outside her house, reading in a big black book. And when she saw the pig's heart, she asked the fool, Are you ready to test if you really got some brains now? The fool was ready. So the old wise woman spoke, Answer me this. What runs without legs? The fool thought and thought some more. And then he said, I don't know. Well, that's it for you today then. No brains for you. Come back when you found what you're looking for. And the old woman closed the book and went back into the house. The fool walked down the hill and came back to his mother's house. But his mother was nowhere to be seen. But then he found her. She was in bed and she looked very pale and very weak. But she opened her eyes and smiled at him. Oh, that's good. You're back from the wise woman. And now you got yourself some brains. 
You know, you need brains to look after yourself. And with that, she smiled and closed her eyes and was dead. The fool sat down by his mother's bed and he thought, Oh, my mother, the one who nursed me as a baby, who always mended my clothes and cooked me my favorite meals. And he noticed it wasn't the pig, it was his mother he loved most in the world. And then he remembered what the wise woman wanted. Oh no, no, I can't take a knife and cut out my mother's heart and bring it to the wise woman. And he thought and he thought for a while, but then he wrapped his mother into a sheet, put her over his shoulder and took his entire mother up to the wise woman. The wise woman was sitting in front of her house. She looked at the fool. She looked at the fool's mother and said, Is this then what you love most in the world? Oh, yes, said the fool. Right, then answer me this. What is yellow and shines? But it's not gold. What is yellow and shines, but it isn't gold? Uh, I don't know. That's it for today, said the wise woman. I have no brains for you. Come back when you found what you were looking for. The fool walked down the hill. He buried his mother and then he sat down by the roadside and big tears were running down his face. Oh my, I've lost everything I loved most in the world. I've butchered my pig, my mother is dead and there's no one who will look after me and I don't even have any brains. Just at that moment, a young woman from the village came by and when she saw the fool in tears, she sat down next to him and she asked, what's wrong? And the fool told her everything about his pig and his mother and who shall look after him now? And he doesn't have any brains. But the young woman said, I would like to look after you. You have a good heart and I've heard fools will make good husbands. Oh, really? said the fool. Can you cook? And uh, can you mend my clothes? And do you sometimes have a good word for me? I sure can do that, said the young woman. Oh, said the fool. I think I can marry you. You're as good as any other. So the two of them got married. And she was a very good wife. She looked after the fool and she cooked his favorite meals and always had a good word for him. And after a while, the fool realized it was his wife he loved most in the world. But then he remembered what the wise woman said. The heart of what I love most in the world? The fool went and told his wife. And his wife looked a bit scared at first, but then she said, you don't need to cut out my heart and bring to the wise woman. I will help you. What was it the old wise woman wanted to know from you? Eh, let me think, said the fool. 
Yeah, there was this one question, really difficult. Uh, uh, what runs without legs? Oh, my dear, said the wife, that's water. Oh, you are a clever woman. I had no idea you know such things. The fool was most impressed. And uh, wasn't there a second riddle? asked the wife. Yes, 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 said the fool. Uh, what is yellow and shines? But it's not gold. Aye, that's the sun, said the wife. Let's go up to the wise woman and see if she has some brains for you now. And when the two arrived at the wise woman's house, she was sitting outside twining straws. And she looked at the fool and she looked at the wife and said nothing for a while. And then she asked, answer me this. What is always there, but it's less than a month old? What is always there, but it is less than a month old? The fool didn't have a clue, but his wife whispered something in his ear. Oh, right, that could be it. Maybe, uh, could it be the moon? And the wise woman nodded and said, there you are, and you already have your brains about you. I have my brains about me. The fool looked around. He checked his pockets. He couldn't find the brain. Ah, the wise woman said. The brains, they are in your wife's head. And with that, the wise woman turned her back and went back into her house. And the fool and his wife walked down the hill, hand in hand. And the fool never tried to buy himself a mug of brains again, because his wife had enough brains for the two of them. Hello, I'm sad not to be making it up to the Storytelling Festival this year, but I thought I would sing you an Orkney song. Normally, I don't ever sing Orkney songs in Orkney because I'm too fat, because uh, most of my versions have kind of deteriorated and angusified over the years. But this is one written by the great Ali Winnick, and it's called Butter on the Bow. Well, when first I tried a tune on my feathers violin, we my dee, my do, my darna diddle I dum do. Ah, my folk were at the kirk on a bonny Sabbath morn, so I thought I'd try a tune with the old man's bow. Took a twiddle at the strings and put the fiddle to my chin. We a mind to keep the Sabbath, so I thought I'd try a hymn. But I got an off a squeak, near Dean a darn a diddle, as I streak it on his fiddle, we the old man's bow. First the wee ginger cart, juke it in below the mat, we my dee, my do. My darn a diddle I dum do, and the duck he raised his chow, and let out a whiffy howl, and he drew to ta the squeaking for the old man's bow. So I tried to tuck my tempo for the wag upon the wa, but my sunky soon did awful like a turkey in the straw. So I tried another key, but the squeak got war than never as a streak it on his fiddle with the old man's bow. 
Me a king guy wheel, how you cure a squeaking wheel? We meddy, meddy, my darna diddle I dum do. And I thinks to myself, says I, there mun be something getting dry, and it do will need to lubricate the old man's bow. So I looked into the cubby hole that's in below the stair, in the box I hint the tractor, but there was no honey there. I looked o'er the place, but the aisle had gain a missing. So I rubbed a clart of butter on the old man's bow. Took a twiddle at the string, so I put the fiddle to my chin. We my de, my do, my darna diddle I he dum do. But as for my tune, you could have heard a dropping pin, for there was nave na whisper, fain the old man's bow. But I've rocked upon that fiddle like a giner me a saw, till the lumps of orkney butter fairly stood it off the wall. But I couldn't get a dee, nor a do na darn a diddle, as I strike it on his fiddle with the old man's bow. Sign the kirk folk come in, and I got scalp it for my sin. We my dee, my do, my darn a diddle I dum do. And I played me sick a tune, as I could na wheel sit doon. But I've mind to boot the butter on the old man's bow. And I'm finished with the fiddle new, without the slightest doot. If I learn another instrument, it's going to be the flute. And when strangers come to visit, and they mark the introductions, I'm the lad that put the butter on the old man's bow. This is my favourite story. It's called Marlene the Trowel. Now, I have the story almost 20 years ago from Lawrence Tullock, the late great storyteller from Shetland. An amazing storyteller and a wonderful friend. Much missed, not just by me, but by storytellers all over Scotland. All over the world, in fact. Let's not put this into a little box here. But he told me this story uh, when I was with Stanley Robertson, the late great traveller storyteller. And it became Stanley's favourite story as well, he said. so. Uh, but the message that it conveys, I think, is something that we should all think about. And especially in these strange COVID times. And in a society where selfishness seems to be the new god then I think that this story should be a lesson to us all. Now, there was once a woman called Mali, and she had a husband called Robbie, and together they had four bairns. Now, Robbie was a sailor, and he would sign on to a ship, and he would sail away, but he would always come back at the winter time, and he would have enough money to fill the meal gurnel, which was a big wooden chest full of meal, so full of flour for making bannocks with. And he would have enough money to buy a bottle of pickled herring as well, salted herring, and that's what they would live on over the winter. Now, one year, Robbie didn't come back. And Mally never heard what happened to him, but she never seen him again. She knew he must be dead, but whether the ship he was on foundered in a storm, or whether he had an accident and was killed, or died of the seas on board, she didn't know, but he never came back. And the fish ran out, and the meal in the gunnel was finished, and there was nothing left for them to eat, and they all got hungrier and hungrier and hungrier, until in the end, one day, Mally decided that the only thing she could do was to take a staff in her hand and put a kishi on her back, straw basket, and go up 
I go around and try to beg for some food. Now there was an old woman who lived up the hill, and it was well known that this old woman had plenty of everything. She wasn't short of anything, and, you know, wasn't bare-fisted, but she was tight-fisted. So Molly went up, knocked on her door, and the old woman answered it. What do you want? she said. I'm really sorry that it's come to this, said Molly, but I'm hungry. My bairns here are hungry too. My husband's lost at sea, and we have no income. We have nothing to buy food with. And the bairns haven't eaten now for a day, and, and they're hungry. Could you see your way clear to maybe giving us a wee bite to eat? Now, the oldest boy, he would have been about 12, 13 or so, he was peeping in through the door behind the old woman, and there in the house was a press. Now, a press was a big, tall cupboard where the food was kept. And he could see that that press was stuffed full of food. There was bread, and there was cheese, and ham, and butter, and jam, and puddings, and all sorts of things. And the old woman looked at Molly, and she said, I'm a poor old woman. I've got nothing to give to the likes of you, and just slammed the door in her face. Well, they headed home with heavy hearts, and the oldest boy, he was in tears. He was trying not to show it because he was ashamed to show that kind of emotions, but the tears were streaming down his face. And he says to his mother, how could you do that? How could you? Did, did you see? Did you see that press of hers? Did you see all the food she had? And yet here we are starving and she won't give us as much as a crust of bread. Nothing. Why did she do that? Well, said Molly. Son, you see, that's just her way. There are two different kinds of people in life, son. There are those who give and those who don't, and she's one of the ones that don't. But remember this, son. We're better than that. We always share. So Molly went home with the bairns, and she got them ready for bed. It was early, but she hoped that they might fall asleep and forget the hunger that was gnawing in their belly for a short time anyway. And she sat by the side of the fire, and she got on with some sewing, mending clothes. When there was a knock at the door. Now, it was unusual, because people didn't normally knock on doors in those days. He just lifted the latch and went in. But... Molly laid down her, her sewing, and she went to the door and opened it, and there was a tiny, tiny wee man. But he had long, straggly hair and a big, long moustache and beard, and Molly knew that this must be a trow, one of the fairy folk. And she said, Can I help you? Oh, take pity on a poor old man, he says. I've been walking all day and I'm tired and I'm sore. Can I come in and spend the night here and get a wee bite to eat? Oh, I'm so sorry, she said. You've come to the wrong house. How's that then? Well, you see, we don't have any food here. There's nothing to give you. If you carry on walking a few miles down that way, then, you know, there are some more houses around there. You might find somebody. Oh, I couldn't walk another step. But you're very welcome to come in and spend the night, if that's any use to you. Oh, thank you, lass, he said, and then he came. Now he sat by the side of the fire, and he looked over, and there was a bed in the room as well. And along the foot of the bed, there was four noses, four pairs of eyes all staring at him. Now the bairns, of course, had woken up and were curious to see who the stranger was. And the old man said, ah, no, come on, woman, you must have something to eat in this house. You know, you can't have nothing, surely. Well, said Molly, I'll do me best. 
and she went over to the meal gun, that big wooden chest, and she opened the lid, and of course the meal was long gone. But she very carefully, she took a knife and she scraped down the sides of the meal gun, and in the corners as well, and she scraped it along into the middle of the floor of the meal gun, it's just a little pile of some of the dust and some of the bits of damp meal that had stuck in the corners. And there was cobwebs among it as well, and there was little bits of flakes of, of wood that she'd managed to scrape off. And, and she very carefully swept it up into a pile, swept it into a little shovel, and she poured it into a bowl, and then she went over to the barrel where the herring had been. Now, there was nothing in there, no, but just some salty water, very salty water. But she dipped in, took up some of that. There was the salty water with fish scales in it. And she thought this might give a bit of flavor to the meal. So she poured it in and she stirred it up until there was a consistency like uh, wallpaper paste. And then very carefully, she divided it equally into six cups. One for the trowel, one for each of her bairns, and one for herself. Now the trowel wasn't impressed. He looks at this cup and he says, What's that stuff? That stuff, says Molly, is the only food that we've got in this house. Ah, well, never mind, he says. You'll have some good strong ale, eh? Some home-brewed ale. Oh, no, 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 she says. I don't have barley to waste on making beer. If I had any barley, I would make bread with it. No, I don't have that, but we've got a good well that's got lovely sweet water, and you can have as much of that as you want. Nah, nah, he says. Ugh, never touch the stuff. She says, well, there is one thing that we do have plenty of, and that's peats. So keep the fire going all night. Keep putting peats on it. You know, the slabs of turf that you cut and dry for fuel. Keep putting peats on the fire. Don't be cold now. So he settled down to spend the night in the stool by the side of the fire, and Molly went to her bed. And in the morning, he got up and he thanked her for the night's accommodation and he went to the door and as he was just about to go out, he stopped and he turned around and he said, you see that, um, that uh, stuff that you gave me to eat last night? Yes, said Manny. Well, was that really the only food you had in the house? That was it, said Molly. And today we don't even have as much as that. Well, it takes a very special kind of person to share the last of the food with a total stranger, said the trout. You have my blessing. And off he went out through the door. Well, blessing or no blessing, thought Molly. Uh, well, if we're going to starve to death, we might as well be comfortable while we do it. So she said to her oldest boy, run out to the peat stack and bring in a basket full of peats. So he did. Took in the peats, but the fire had burned low. So if you put a big slab of peat on it, it just wouldn't catch. So she took a peat and she snapped it in two to make it smaller to go on fire. And as she snapped it, tink, something fell out of it. And she looked down and what should she see but a gold coin. Well, it was more money than Molly had ever seen in her life before. She took another peat and snapped it, and ding, another coin fell out of it, and another peat, ding, another one, and ding, 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 ding. Gold coins in every peat. Well, Molly was stunned, and then she realized what the trial meant by having his blessing. Oh, she said, we're saved. Son, run down to the shop and, and, and buy some, some bread and, and some cheese and, and, and butter 
and, and get some milk and, and tea as well, uh, and some ham, uh, and oh, the jam, oh God, do you remember strawberry jam? It's, just go and get anything you want. Oh, the boy didn't need a second telling. He was out like a shot, and he came back loaded down with food. And they sat down at that table, and they ate like royalty. They'd never eaten better in their life. And after that, every time that Molly broke a peat, there was a gold coin in it. Now, people started to wonder, where's Molly getting all this cash from? I mean, there she was, poor as a church mouse. And now suddenly, she's got gold coins to splash around. It's very strange. And nobody wondered harder than the old woman who lived up the hill. And one night, the old woman crept down to Molly's house and peeped through the window. And she saw Molly breaking a peat and a gold coin falling out of it. And she thought, ha ha, so that's her game, is it? Bet you that's trowy money. Well, why shouldn't I have some trowy money as well? I'm a poor old woman. I deserve to have money as well. I should have gold coins. Yes, I should. It's my right. Well, that night, she waited and watched until she saw the lights going out in Molly's house. And then she went off doon to the peat stack with a kishy on her back, a straw basket. She went to the peat stack and she stole Molly's peats and carried them up the hill and tipped them out in the kitchen floor. And that wasn't enough for her, though. She went back down and stole more peats. And then she went back and got more. And she went back and forth all night, stealing Molly's peats, tipping them out on the floor of her kitchen, until the sun started to rise. And she thought then that maybe people would see her. So then she stopped. And then she stood there with a big pile of stolen pits in front of her and she thought, now it's my turn to get rich. My turn to get gold coins. So she picked the pit up and she snapped it and squeak! Out fell a mouse, a live mouse, and it scuttled off into the corner. Hmm, she thought, a dud. I'll try another one. So she broke another one. Squeak! Another mouse came out into the corner. Broke another one. Squeak! 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 Every time she broke a peat, there was a moose inside it. And the moose scuttled away into the corner until she had broken every peat. And every peat had a live mouse inside it. And then the mice got together. They're quite democratic creatures, mice, you know. So they had a little election and they sort of selected a Jarl moose. And the moose said, well, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. What's to eat in this house? Oh, look, there's a press full of bread and cheese and ham and butter and puddings and the jam. And <laughs> Come on, let's feast. So the mice swarmed into her press and they ate every scrap of food that that old woman had. They left not a crumb. And then they ate holes through her skirting board and her walls and they nibbled holes in all her clothes and all her blankets and everything that she had was riddled, even the curtains was riddled with holes. The whole inside of the house was like Swiss cheese. Well, the poor old woman, she had nothing left. She had no money. She had some banknotes in a tin under the bed, but that's a lovely nest for a mouse. And they nibbled it up till it was like confetti. Well, what could she do but put a kishi on her back, which was full of holes as well, but she had to get some dried grass and stuff in the holes and then take her staff in her hand and go begging. And who was the first person she went begging to but Molly? She knocked on the door, and Molly's oldest son opened it, and he saw the old woman standing there, and he said, What do you want? And she said, Oh, please take pity on a poor old woman. Uh, 
I've had a terrible plague of mice up at my house, and I've got, they've eaten all my food. I've got nothing left. I have nothing to eat. I wonder if you could see your way clear to giving me a wee bite to eat. Well, the boy looked at her in disbelief, and he said, Old woman, I'll give you exactly what you gave us when we were starving and hungry and had to go begging. Nothing. And he slammed the door in her face. But Molly was standing in the corner of the room, and she shook her head, and she said, No, son, I told you we are better than that. We share. And she went to the door, and she called, Old woman, old woman, come back here, come here. And the old woman went back, and Molly said to her, Old woman, I'll give you as much food as you can carry up the road there with you. And know this, as long as I'm alive, you will never have to go hungry.